Book 21. Odysseus strings his bow. The time had come. The goddess Athena with her blazing eyes inspired Penelope, Icaria's daughter, wary, poised, to set the bow and the gleaming iron axes out before her suitors waiting in Odysseus' hall to test their skill and bring their slaughter on. Up the steep stairs to her room she climbed and grasped in a steady hand the curved key fine bronze, with ivory half detached and then with her chamberwomen made her way to a hidden storeroom, far in the palace depths, and there they lay, the royal master's treasures, bronze, gold and a wealth of hard wrought iron and there it lay as well his back sprung bow with its quiver bristling arrows, shafts of pain. Gifts from the old days, from a friend he'd met in Lacedaemon Iphitus, Eurytus' gallant son. Once in Messene the two struck up together, in sly Autolocus' house, that time Odysseus went to collect a debt the whole realm owed him, four Messenian raiders had lifted flocks from Ithaca, three hundred head in their oar-swept ships, the herdsmen too. So his father and island elders sent Odysseus off, a young boy on a mission, a distant embassy made to right that wrong. Iphitus went there hunting the stock that he had lost, a dozen mares still nursing their hardy suckling mules. The same mares that would prove his certain death when he reached the son of Zeus, that iron heart, Heracles the past master of monstrous works who killed the man, a guest in his own house. Brutal. Not a care for the wrathful eyes of God or rites of hospitality he had spread before him, no, he dined him, then he murdered him, commandeered those hard-hoofed mares for the hero's own grange. Still on the trail of these when he met Odysseus, Iphitus gave him the bow his father, mighty Eurytus, used to wield as a young man, but when he died in his lofty house he left it to his son. In turn, Odysseus gave his friend a sharp sword and a rugged spear to mark the start of friendship, treasured ties that bind. But before they got to know the warmth of each other's board, the son of Zeus had murdered Iphitus, Eurytus' magnificent son who gave the prince the bow. That great weapon King Odysseus never took it abroad with him when he sailed off to war in his long black ships. He kept it stored away in his stately house, guarding the memory of a cherished friend, and only took that bow on hunts at home. Now, the lustrous queen soon reached the hidden vault and stopped at the oaken door sill, work an expert sanded smooth and true to the line some years ago, planting the door jam snugly, hanging shining doors. At once she loosed the thong from around its hook, inserted the key and aiming straight and true, shot back the bolts and the rasping doors groaned as loud as a bull will bellow, champing grass at pasture. So as the key went home those handsome double doors rang out now and sprang wide before her. She stepped onto a plank where chests stood tall, brimming with clothing scented sweet with cedar. Reaching, tiptoe, lifting the bow down off its peg, still secure in the burnished case that held it, down she sank, laying the case across her knees, and dissolved in tears with a high thin wail as she drew her husband's weapon from its sheath then, having wept and sobbed to her heart's content, off she went to the hall to meet her proud admirers, cradling her husband's backsprung bow in her arms, its quiver bristling arrows, shafts of pain. Her women followed, bringing a chest that held the bronze and the iron axes, trophies won by the master. That radiant woman, once she reached her suitors, drawing her glistening veil across her cheeks, paused now where a column propped the sturdy roof, with one of her loyal handmaids stationed either side, and delivered an ultimatum to her suitors, listen to me, my overbearing friends. You who plague this palace night and day, drinking, eating us out of house and home with the lord and master absent, gone so long the only excuse that you can offer is your zest to win me as your bride. So, to arms, my gallants. Here is the prize at issue, right before you, look I set before you the great bow of King Odysseus now. The hand that can string this bow with greatest ease, that shoots an arrow clean through all twelve axes he is the man I follow, yes, forsaking this house where I was once a bride, this gracious house so filled with the best that life can offer I shall always remember it, that I know even in my dreams. She turned to Eumaeus, ordered the good swineherd now to set the bow and the gleaming iron axes out before the suitors. He broke into tears as he received them, laid them down. The cowherd wept too, when he saw his master's bow. But Antinous wheeled on both and let them have it, yokels, fools you can't tell night from day. You mawkish idiots, why are you snivelling here? You're stirring up your mistress. Isn't she drowned in grief already? She's lost her darling husband. Sit down. Eat in peace, or take your snuffling out of doors. But leave that bow right here our crucial test that makes or breaks us all. No easy game, I wager, to string his polished bow. Not a soul in the crowd can match Odysseus what a man he was I saw him once, remember him to this day, though I was young and foolish way back then. 
smooth talk, but deep in the suitor's heart his hopes were bent on stringing the bow and shooting through the axes. Antinous fated to be the first man to taste an arrow whipped from great Odysseus' hands, the king he mocked, at ease in the king's house, egging comrades on to mock him too. Amazing. Prince Telemachus waded in with a laugh, Zeus up there has robbed me of my wits. My own dear mother, sensible as she is, says she'll marry again, forsake our house, and look at me laughing for all I'm worth, giggling like some fool. Step up, my friends. Here is the prize at issue, right before you, look a woman who has no equal now in all Achaean country, neither in holy Pylos, nor in Argos or Mycenae, not even Ithaca itself or the Lomi mainland. You know it well. Why sing my mother's praises? Come, let the games begin. No dodges, no delays, no turning back from the stringing of the bow we'll see who wins, we will. I'd even take a crack at the bow myself if I string it and shoot through all the axes, I'd worry less if my noble mother left our house with another man and left me here behind man enough at last to win my father's splendid prizes. With that he leapt to his feet and dropped his bright red cloak, slipping the sword and sword belt off his shoulders. First he planted the axes, digging a long trench, one for all, and trued them all to a line, then tamped the earth to bed them. Wonder took the revelers looking on, his work so firm, precise, though he'd never seen the axes ranged before. He stood at the threshold, poised to try the bow three times he made it shudder, straining to bend it, three times his power flagged but his hopes ran high he'd string his father's bow and shoot through every iron and now, struggling with all his might for the fourth time, he would have strung the bow, but Odysseus shook his head and stopped him short despite his tensing zeal. God help me, the inspired prince cried out, must I be a weakling, a failure all my life? Unless I'm just too young to trust my hands to fight off any man who rises up against me. Come, my betters, so much stronger than I am try the bow and finish off the contest. He propped his father's weapon on the ground, tilting it up against the polished well-hung doors and resting a shaft to slant the bow's fine horn, then back he went to the seat that he had left. Up, friends! Antinous called, taking over. One man after another, left to right, starting from where the steward pours the wine. So Antinous urged and all agreed. The first man up was Leodes, Enop's son, a seer who could see their futures in the smoke, who always sat by the glowing wine bowl, well back, the one man in the group who loathed their reckless ways, appalled by all their outrage. His turn first picking up the weapon now and the swift arrow, he stood at the threshold, poised to try the bow but failed to bend it. As soon as he tugged the string his hands went slack, his soft, uncalloused hands, and he called back to the suitors, friends, I can't bend it. Take it, someone try. Here is a bow to rob our best of life and breath, all our best contenders. Still, better be dead than live on here, never winning the prize that tempts us all forever in pursuit, burning with expectation every day. If there's still a suitor here who hopes, who aches to marry Penelope, Odysseus' wife, just let him try the bow, he'll see the truth. He'll soon lay siege to another Argive woman trailing her long robes, and shower her with gifts and then our queen can marry the one who offers most, the man marked out by fate to be her husband. With those words he thrust the bow aside, tilting it up against the polished well-hung doors and resting a shaft aslant the bow's fine horn, then back he went to the seat that he had left. But Antinous turned on the seer, abuses flying, Leodes. What are you saying? What's got past your lips? What awful, grisly nonsense it shocks me to hear it, here is a bow to rob our best of life and breath. Just because you can't string it, you're, so weak? Clearly your genteel mother never bred her boy for the work of bending bows and shooting arrows. We have champions in our ranks to string it quickly. Hop to it, Melanthius, he barked at the goat herd, rake the fire in the hall, pull up a big stool, heap it with fleece and fetch that hefty ball of lard from the stores inside. So we young lords can heat and limber the bow and rub it down with grease before we try again and finish off the contest. The goat herd bustled about to rake the fire still going strong. He pulled up a big stool, heaped it with fleece and fetched the hefty ball of lard from the stores inside. And the young men limbered the bow, rubbing it down with hot grease, then struggled to bend it back but failed. No use they fell far short of the strength the bow required. Antina still held off, dashing Eurymachus too, the ringleaders of all the suitors, head and shoulders the strongest of the L.O.T. But now the king's two men, the cowherd and the swineherd, had slipped out of the palace side by side and great Odysseus left the house to join them. 
Once they were past the courtyard and the gates he probed them deftly, surely, cowherd, swineherd, what, shall I blurt this out or keep it to myself? No, speak out. The heart inside me says so. How far would you go to fight beside Odysseus? Say he dropped like that from a clear blue sky and a god brought him back would you fight for the suitors or your king? Tell me how you feel inside your hearts. Father Zeus, the trusty cowherd shouted, bring my prayer to pass. Let the master come some god guide him now. You'd see my power, my fighting arms in action. Eumaeus echoed his prayer to all the gods that their wise king would soon come home again. Certain at least these two were loyal to the death, Odysseus reassured them quickly, I'm right here, here in the flesh myself and home at last, after bearing twenty years of brutal hardship. Now I know that of all my men you two alone longed for my return. From the rest I've heard not one real prayer that I come back again. So now I'll tell you what's in store for you. If a god beats down the lofty suitors at my hands, I'll find you wives, both of you, grant you property, sturdy houses beside my own, and in my eyes you'll be comrades to Prince Telemachus, brothers from then on. Come, I'll show you something living proof know me for certain, put your minds at rest. This scar, look, where a boar's white tusk gored me, years ago, hunting on Parnassus, Autolycus' sons and I. With that, pushing back his rags, he revealed the great scar and the men gazed at it, scanned it, knew it well, broke into tears and threw their arms around their master lost in affection, kissing his head and shoulders, and so Odysseus kissed their heads and hands. Now the sun would have set upon their tears if Odysseus had not called a halt himself. No more weeping. Coming out of the house a man might see us, tell the men inside. Let's slip back in singly, not in a pack. I'll go first. You're next. Here's our signal. When all the rest in there, our lordly friends, are dead against my having the bow and quiver, good Eumaeus, carry the weapon down the hall and put it in my hands. Then tell the serving women to lock the snugly fitted doors to their own rooms. If anyone hears from there the jolting blows and groans of men, caught in our huge net, not one of them show her face sit tight, keep to her weaving, not a sound. You, my good Philoetius, here are your orders. Shoot the bolt of the courtyard's outer gate, lock it, lash it fast. With that command the master entered his well-constructed house and back he went to the stool that he had left. The king's two men, in turn, slipped in as well. Just now Eurymachus held the bow in his hands, turning it over, tip to tip, before the blazing fire to heat the weapon. But he failed to bend it even so and the suitor's high heart groaned to bursting. A black day, he exclaimed in wounded pride, a blow to myself, a blow to each man here. It's less the marriage that mortifies me now that's galling too, but lots of women are left, some in Seagirt Ithaca, some in other cities. What breaks my heart is the fact we fall so short of great Odysseus' strength we cannot string his bow. A disgrace to ring in the ears of men to come. Eurymachus, Eupith's son Antinous countered, it will never come to that, as you well know. Today is a feast day up and down the island in honor of the archer god. Who flexes bows today? Set it aside. Rest easy now. And all the axes, let's just leave them planted where they are. Trust me, no one's about to crash the gates of Let's Sun and carry off these trophies. Steward, pour some drops for the god in every cup, we'll tip the wine, then put the bow to bed. And first thing in the morning have Melanthius bring the pick of his goats from all his herds so we can burn the thighs to Apollo, god of archers then try the bow and finish off the contest. Welcome advice. And again they all agreed. Herald sprinkled water over their hands for rinsing, the young men brimmed the mixing bowls with wine, they tipped first drops for the god in every cup, then poured full rounds for all. And now, once they tipped libations out and drunk their fill, the king of craft, Odysseus, said with all his cunning, listen to me, you lords who caught the noble queen. I have to say what the heart inside me urges. I appeal especially to Eurymachus, and you, brilliant Antinous, who spoke so shrewdly now. Give the bow a rest for today, leave it to the gods at dawn the archer god will grant a victory to the man he favors most. For the moment, give me the polished bow now, won't you? So, to amuse you all, I can try my hand, my strength is the old force still alive inside these gnarled limbs? Or has a life of roaming, years of rough neglect, destroyed it long ago? Modest words that sent them all into hot, indignant rage, fearing he just might string the polished bow. 
So Antinous rounded on him, dressed him down, not a shred of sense in your head, you filthy drifter. Not content to feast at your ease with us, the island pride? Never denied your full share of the banquet, never, you can listen in on our secrets. No one else can eavesdrop on our talk, no tramp, no beggar. The wine has overpowered you, heady wine the ruin of many another man, whoever gulps it down and drinks beyond his limit. Wine it drove the centaur, famous Eurytian, mad in the halls of lion-hearted Pirithus. There to visit the Lapiths, crazed with wine the headlong centaur bent to his ugly work in the prince's own house. His host sprang up, seized with fury, dragged him across the forecourt, flung him out of doors, hacking his nose and ears off with their knives, no mercy. The creature reeled away, still blind with drink, his heart like a wild storm, loaded with all the frenzy in his mind. And so the feud between mortal men and centaurs had its start. But the drunk was first to bring disaster on himself by drowning in his cups. You too, I promise you no end of trouble if you should string that bow. You'll meet no kindness in our part of the world will sail you off in a black ship to Ecatus, the mainland king who wrecks all men alive. Nothing can save you from his royal grip. So drink, but hold your peace, don't take on the younger, stronger men. Antinous, watchful Penelope stepped in, how impolite it would be, how wrong, to scant whatever guest Telemachus welcomes to his house. You really think if the stranger trusts so to his hands and strength that he strings Odysseus' great bow he'll take me home and claim me as his bride? He never dreamed of such a thing, I'm sure. Don't let that ruin the feast for any reveller here. Unthinkable nothing, nothing could be worse. Polybus' son Eurymachus had an answer, wise Penelope, daughter of Icarius, do we really expect the man to wed you? Unthinkable, I know. But we do recoil at the talk of men and women. One of the island's meaner sort will mutter, look at the riffraff courting a king's wife. Weaklings, look, they can't even string his bow. But along came this beggar, drifting out of the blue strung his bow with ease and shot through all the axes. Gossip will fly. We'll hang our heads in shame. Shame, alert Penelope protested, how can you hope for any public fame at all? You who disgrace, devour a great man's house and home. Why hang your heads in shame over next to nothing? Our friend here is a strapping, well-built man and claims to be the son of a noble father. Come, hand him the bow now, let's just see I tell you this and I'll make good my word if he strings the bow and Apollo grants him glory, I'll dress him in shirt and cloak, in handsome clothes, I'll give him a good sharp lance to fight off men and dogs, give him a two-edged sword and sandals for his feet and send him off, wherever his heart desires. Mother, poised Telemachus broke in now, my father's bow no Achaean on earth has more right than I to give it or withhold it, as I please. Of all the lords in Ithaca's rocky heights or the islands facing Ellis grazed by horses, not a single one will force or thwart my will, even if I decide to give our guest this bow a gift outright to carry off himself. So, mother, go back to your quarters. Tend to your own tasks, the distaff and the loom, and keep the women working hard as well. As for the bow now, men will see to that, but I most of all, I hold the reins of power in this house. Astonished, she withdrew to her own room. She took to heart the clear good sense in what her son had said. Climbing up to the lofty chamber with her women, she fell to weeping for Odysseus, her beloved husband, till watchful Athena sealed her eyes with welcome sleep. And now the loyal swineherd had lifted up the bow, was taking it toward the king, when all the suitors burst out in an ugly uproar through the palace brash young bullies, this or that one heckling, where on earth are you going with that bow? You, you grubby swineherd, are you crazy? The speedy dogs you reared will eat your corpse out there with your pigs, out in the cold, alone. If only Apollo and all the gods shine down on us. Eumaeus froze in his tracks, put down the bow, panicked by every outcry in the hall. Telemachus shouted too, from the other side, and full of threats, carry on with the bow, old boy. If you serve too many masters, you'll soon suffer. Look sharp, or I'll pelt you back to your farm with flying rocks. I may be younger than you but I'm much stronger. If only I had that edge in fists and brawn over all this courting crowd, I'd soon dispatch them licking their wounds at last clear of our palace where they plot their vicious plots. His outburst sent them all into gales of laughter, blithe and oblivious, that dissolved their pique against the prince. 
The swineherd took the bow, carried it down the hall to his ready, waiting king and standing by him, placed it in his hands, then he called the nurse aside and whispered, Good Eurycleia Telemachus commands you now to lock the snugly fitted doors to your own rooms. If anyone hears from there the jolting blows and groans of men, caught in our huge net, not one of you show your face it tight, keep to your weaving, not a sound. That silenced the old nurse she barred the doors that led from the long hall. The cowherd quietly bounded out of the house to lock the gates of the high stockaded court. Under the portico lay a cable, ship's tough gear, he lashed the gates with this, then slipped back in and ran and sat on the stool that he'd just left, eyes riveted on Odysseus. Now he held the bow in his own hands, turning it over, tip to tip, testing it, this way, that way fearing worms had bored through the weapon's horn with the master gone abroad. A suitor would glance at his neighbor, jeering, taunting, look at our connoisseur of bows. Sly old fox maybe he's got bows like it, stored in his house. That or he's bent on making one himself. Look how he twists and turns it in his hands. The clever tramp means trouble, I wish him luck, some cocksure lord chimed in, as good as his luck in bending back that weapon. So they mocked, but Odysseus, mastermind in action, once he'd handled the great bow and scanned every inch, then, like an expert singer skilled at lyre and song who strains a string to a new peg with ease, making the pliant sheep gut fast at either end so with his virtuoso ease Odysseus strung his mighty bow. Quickly his right hand plucked the string to test its pitch and under his touch it sang out clear and sharp as a swallow's cry. Horror swept through the suitors, faces blanching white, and Zeus cracked the sky with a bolt, his blazing sign, and the great man who had borne so much rejoiced at last that the son of cunning Cronus flung that omen down for him. He snatched a winged arrow lying bare on the board the rest still bristled deep inside the quiver, soon to be tasted by all the feasters there. Setting shaft on the hand grip, drawing the notch and bowstring back, back right from his stool, just as he sat but aiming straight and true, he let fly and never missing an axe from the first axe handle clean on through to the last and out the shaft with its weighted brazen head shot free. My son, Odysseus looked to Telemachus and said, your guest, sitting here in your house, has not disgraced you. No missing the mark, look, and no long labor spent to string the bow. My strength's not broken yet, not quite so frail as the mocking suitors thought. But the hour has come to serve our master's right supper in broad daylight then to other revels, song and dancing, all that crowns a feast. He paused with a warning nod, and at that sign Prince Telemachus, son of King Odysseus, girding his sharp sword on, clamping hand to spear, took his stand by a chair that flanked his father his bronze spearpoint glinting now like fire. 